My first guest tonight, Amy Swearer, a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, testified before Congress this week on those very House bills that Biden mentions. First, let's listen to part of her testimony and then we'll bring her on to discuss. HR 8 places significant mental, emotional, and practical barriers between responsible gun owners and low-risk informal gun transfers that save countless lives every year. The bill limits temporary emergency transfers to only when they're necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm, and the transfers can last only as long as immediately necessary. Now, Senators, I, I have no doubt that the language for this carve-out is well-intentioned, but it's so limited as to serve no real purpose. Nearly two-thirds of all gun deaths every year are suicides. 24,000 Americans killed themselves with firearms in 2019. And there's every reason to believe that number is higher for 2020. Mental health awareness and suicide prevention are vital but often difficult conversations for gun owners. There's a very real and, frankly, a very legitimate fear that if we are open and honest about our mental health difficulties, politicians and gun control activists will use it to impose crushing long-term consequences on our Second Amendment rights. So one very common solution is to seek informal help and to leave firearms with trusted friends or family members the moment we realize that we're not okay, and for as long as we realize we are not okay. I can't stress enough how important this mechanism is for suicide prevention and how often it occurs precisely because it is informal. Many gun owners who might otherwise agree to temporarily hand over their firearms will balk at that same suggestion if it means they have to publicly traipse down to a gun store, wait around for a background check, and legally relinquish title and ownership of their guns to someone else. This is a deeply personal issue for me. Like everyone else, I've had ups and downs in this life. And as a responsible gun owner, I have made that very prudent decision to ask friends to temporarily take my guns when I've been down. The last thing, the last thing I would have needed was the government getting in the way of me doing the right thing. And I speak on behalf of countless other gun owners who have made this same responsible decision under similar circumstances, but who would be terrified of admitting that to anyone, much less to the federal government. Amy Swearer, of course, joins us now. Thanks for being here tonight, Amy. That was a brilliant and heartfelt testimony you gave. Thank you so much for having me. So your testimony was mostly in regard to the recently passed H.R. 8 bill. Talk to me about what's inside the bill and why you have such grave concerns about it, especially now that Biden is calling on the Senate to pass it. So at its core, H.R. 8 uh, does address what I would consider a, a low reward but legitimate concern. Uh, and that, that is with respect to its, uh, gun sales uh, that are publicly advertised. So if you go onto arms list, for example, and you're not a federal firearms licensee, um, you can sell a gun to someone in, in your own state without going through a background check. Now, we know that this is not how most criminals get their guns. Um, it is a very low reward endeavor, but it is perhaps worth addressing. I think that the problem with HR8 is that it takes it well beyond this, this limited uh, area of concern. And it starts getting into basically any low risk temporary transfer, uh, including, as I mentioned in my testimony, these very common um, transfers that are made by gun owners well, for their own personal safety or to address someone else's personal safety, if, you know, for instances of um, domestic violence or uh, you know d domestic uh, tranquility, like we, we saw this this summer uh, with some of the And so also H.R. 8, it was passed recently in the House along with a companion bill, the H.R. 1446, and it's one that Democrats claim will close what they call the Charleston loophole. It allows the feds to expand the amount of time between gun purchase and the, the, the buyer actually receiving their gun. They say that's something that the Charleston church shooter uh, many several years ago, that he was able to exploit that to get his gun early and uh, commit his evil rampage uh, that he did. But, it, but it's interesting to me that Congress seems to think that they can just pass a law and that a criminal who's, who's going to go and wants to kill people, who's evil, and they're going to go, well, that's one law I won't break gun laws. Uh, uh, talk to me a little bit about that as well, HR, four, uh, HR 1446. Sure. So I think it's important to 
first correct the Powell-Arlston loophole. Um, so what actually happened in that case was not that uh, the you know the, the shooter got his gun because it took longer than three days. What actually happened was that the FBI failed to um, to, to find out for whatever reason they missed the part where he had a disqualifying uh, arrest for um, for illegal drug possession. Um, so right off the bat, it, it starts with a mischaracterization. But then on top of that. He, when people talk about these, uh, you know, this three-day limit, they they tend to then end and say, oh, okay, and then the FBI just apparently stops running these background checks. So if you make it past three days, well, you know, good for you. But that's actually not what happens. Um, so the FBI continues to run those background checks if the person is ultimately found to be prohibited. That's forwarded to the ATF. The ATF um, thousands of times a year goes and actually seizes those weapons, takes those weapons back. Um, so it's not as though there's nothing in place. Regardless, even if this is, you know, again, a very limited concern, this is not realistically how most criminals are getting their guns. You know, the, the proper way of addressing that is not to say, okay, now the government has 20 days um, and you have no recourse, too bad, so sad. Um, you know, that, that's just not how we ought to be doing public policy. And aside from Biden calling on the Senate now to pass these these pairs uh, these pair of House bills, he was also saying a an assault weapons ban. Uh, of course, that's a, a vague term that many have issues with as well. But he pointed back to the Clinton years of the assault weapons ban of 1994 up through into 2004. Is there any indication at all, despite all the media headlines, that actually that that bill that actually reduced gun crime in general or even mass shooting specifically? No, so beyond the constitutional problems with it, and there are plenty of constitutional problems with it, especially post Heller and McDonald, which were, were not case law at that point, um, you know, you're looking at um, a, a law that the official study on that afterwards basically said, look, if you were to reenact this, it wouldn't make a significant difference because these guns are not the type that are most often used in crime. Um, so it's, it's a very, very, again, a low reward policy. But even when you look at some of these tragic mass shootings where uh, you know, th these firearms are, compared to other types of crimes, more disproportionately used, most of these uh, crimes, unfortunately, could be committed with any other type of weapon and be just as deadly. Um, you know, you, you see this right now. We, we had a, a spree shooting with eight dead in Atlanta. That individual used uh, a handgun. And you look at the shooter now in Boulder, uh, it now seems clear that he had at least two firearms and that uh, he's dealing, you're dealing with a state that already in Colorado imposes a, a ban on new purchases of magazines capable of holding more than 15 rounds. Um, so it, again, it's just not really addressing major parts of the problem. It's sort of papering over it. Um, and it's just especially worth it. Amy, once again, uh, brilliant testimony that we saw the other day on Capitol Hill. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to come join us. Thank you.